Hi everyone, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game, Video Game High School by Plaid Hat Games, which takes place in an alternate reality very similar to our own, except now the most popular sport is video games. So students attend classes to gain skills in first person shooters, fighters, racing games, rhythm, and real time strategies, all in an effort to gain the most glory and lucrative endorsements. So as students, you'll be attending Video Game High School, which is based on the very same, very popular YouTube series. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. First, we place the game board on the table. And above it, we put the five score track cards. On top of those, we place the five different video games, overlapping the score tracks like this. Near each, we'll place a high score token, and nearby the bonus points token supply. There are several copies of each of the five different double-sided skill tokens. You can sort them all into their own piles or just make one big messy pile like I usually do. These are the challenge cards which you shuffle into a face down deck that you place here on the game board. Each player now picks one of the six possible characters to play as, choosing their character card and placing it in front of them. You then collect the three matching character standees, put them in stands, and then place them on your character card. Any unused characters and their stands can be returned to the box. Then take your matching rank tokens and place them on the 50 position of the rank track. Next, each player collects the three power cards associated with their character and keeps them in their hand. Then take five skill dice, which you'll keep during the game, to roll to determine the first player. Whoever rolls the most racing car symbols will go first. And this crest is a wild, so you'll count that as well. The first player then takes the first player token. And that's the setup. In video game high school, each player is trying to be the first to attain the top position on the rank track. The game is played over a series of rounds, and each round is divided into three phases. The prepare, player turns, and challenge phases. The prepare phase begins with the first player flipping over the top card of the challenge deck in the Grand Theft Auditorium. Now all of the players at once will roll their five skill dice, and you may choose to re-roll any of the dice up to two more times. Once you're done, place your dice to the left of your character card. This area is known as your active pool. Unused dice and skill tokens will go here. This space to the right of your character is known as the inactive pool. At this time, if you have any temporary skill tokens in your inactive pool, these are the tokens showing the yellow side, they are now returned to the supply. However, if you have any permanent skill tokens here, the ones showing the blue side, they are returned to your active pool. Finally, you return all of your character standees to your character card. Now, as this is the first turn of the game, some of those steps may have felt a little irrelevant, but don't worry, by the end of the instructional video, it'll all make sense. And we'll go over that prepare phase quickly one more time at the end, just to make sure it's clear. Next is the player turns phase. Starting with the first player and going in clockwise order, each player takes a turn, placing one of their standees on one of the spaces of the game board or one of the games at the top of the game board, and then you resolve that space. You do this going back and forth until each of the standees have been placed for all of the players. And then it's time for the challenge phase. But let's start by taking a look at how the different spaces on the game board work. Each location in the top right hand corner shows two symbols. The first symbol indicates the maximum number of character standees that can be placed in this location during a round. For example, once Jenny Matrix is placed here, no other standees can be placed in the cafeteria. However, in the study hall, up to four character standees can be placed in that location. Once a character is placed, you resolve the effect of that location. This symbol indicates how many different times you can resolve that effect when you place a single character there. For example, in the cafeteria, it says that I can change the face of one of my dice, like so. But I can do this up to three times, so I can actually change three of my dice. But now let's quickly take a look at the rest of the rooms in the high school. These five classrooms all work essentially the same way. They can hold at most one person, but when placed, 
you can activate them three times. When you put a character there, you may choose to move one die from your active pool to your inactive pool in order to collect one temporary skill token of the shown type. The die you trade in can have any symbol on it. This newly collected token will then go to your active pool. Or you may take any two matching dice from your active pool, move them to your inactive pool, and then collect a permanent skill token of the type shown. As I mentioned, each of these classrooms work the same way. The difference is just the kind of temporary or permanent skill token that you can collect. Temporary tokens are good for one use only, whereas permanent skill tokens can be used over and over again, so they are more valuable. Going to the dorms lets you change the face of one of your dice and collect the first player token. Placing your character in the rumpus room lets you simply gain any single temporary skill token. The Kojima Quad lets you take back one of your used power cards. Each player starts with three of them and on your turn at any point, you can play one of them, resolving it and putting it in your inactive pool. Once played, you will not get to use that power again unless you go to the Kojima Quad and reclaim it, putting it back into your hand. The Daily Dean allows you to take a permanent or temporary skill token from another player's active or inactive pool and put it in your active pool. The Study Hall lets you trade in any three temporary skill tokens for any one permanent skill token. And the Cafeteria, we already discussed, it allows you to change the face of your rolled skill dice. It's important to pay attention to the wording of the locations. For example, these classes specify that you must trade in dice, not tokens, to trigger their effects. Whereas the study hall, if you go there, it says spend three skills. So those skills could come from tokens or dice. I might use a fighting die, this temporary rhythm token, and this permanent racing token. Now I'm allowed to collect a permanent skill token, which I would then add to my active pool. Remember, at the start of the next round, I'll collect my dice back along with any permanent skill tokens, but temporary skill tokens will go back to the supply. The final space on the game board is the Grand Theft Auditorium. You can place your character here as long as you have the skills listed to spend. In this example, I might use these two dice and this skill token. Keep in mind, the crest symbol is wild. So in this case, it's going to represent the fighter skill that I was missing. You then immediately claim the reward. In this case, I gain three ranks. Anytime you gain ranks, you move your token on the rank track, keeping in mind that a lower value is better than a higher one. If you would ever exactly land on another player's rank token, you push them back one rank and go in the space that they were in. This could cause a chain reaction of tokens being bumped. But if an effect causes multiple players to lose ranks at the same time, they are adjusted simultaneously. They all shift at once. Along with the rooms, there are five games that you can also place the character standees on. At most, one character can be put on each of the five games. Once placed, you may then spend as many skills as you can or want that match the symbol shown on that game. So Jenny Matrix might spend Four skills, three from dice and one from a token. Each skill spent this way will earn you one million points, which you show by shifting the scorecard up from behind the game. For each million points scored, you also gain one rank. The scorecards help keep track of the highest scores made during the game, and they remain in place until a higher score is created. Whenever a player sets a new high score, as Jenny Matrix has done here, you place the high score token on the game. If any bonus tokens had been on the game when that high score was set, those tokens would be collected by the player as well and returned to the supply, but you would also gain an additional rank for each bonus token collected. So two more ranks for Jenny in this case. We'll see how bonus tokens end up on these games a little bit later. You do not have to set a new high score to place your standee here on a future turn. Brian D may only use two FPS skills. He still scores two million points and gains two ranks, but the scorecard isn't shifted, the high score token isn't placed, and if there had been any bonus tokens on the card, they would remain there. Once all the players have placed their standees, it's time for the challenge phase. First, 
Each player that doesn't have a standee on the Grand Theft Auditorium will suffer the game over effect. In this case, Jenny Matrix is going to lose two ranks. The challenge card is then removed from the game. Then you add one bonus token to every game that doesn't have a high score token. And then you remove all the high score tokens. Then a new round begins, starting with the prepare phase. And now that you know all the rules, let's quickly go over that phase again. First of all, you reveal a new challenge card. Then all of the players take all of their dice, used or otherwise, and re-roll them to create a new active pool. Any temporary skill tokens that you have in your inactive pool are returned to the supply, and any permanent tokens you have go back to your active pool. Players take back all of their standees and put them on the character card, and then the player turns phase begins, starting with the player in possession of the first player token. If a player ever reaches the very first rank, the game immediately ends and they win. Or if a challenge card would need to be revealed and there isn't one left, the player with the highest rank at that point would then be the winner. And that's how you play Video Game High School. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. And I do hope you'll consider subscribing to our channel because in future episodes, we're gonna do a full playthrough of Video Game High School and you can participate. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.